<laughs> All right. Hey, Carl, one second. Let me get everything situated here and make sure that we are live on Facebook and that people can hear us. So you got your Alexa running there in the background. Uh, well, she should be quiet until about 4.30 now, yeah. <laughs> While we see if we're running on Facebook, I'll tell you a funny story. I was doing one of these live workouts, and it was right at the end as we were wrapping up breast cancer awareness, and I said, now watch this. I said, Alexa, play pink. And everybody who was watching, it actually started playing pink on oh, really? <laughs> at their oh, yeah, home. So I thought that was pretty funny. All right, I'm still not seeing this, so let's just one. I can really second. see my white hairs and my beard, can't you? <laughs> oh well. Oh well. It I means we're wiser. It means we're alive, right? Hopefully we're getting wiser and not anything bad. All right. So let me put this on. Testing here. Okay. And we can hear you too. Okay. So let me mute right. that. One second here. All right. All right. So I didn't start playing your, it didn't start playing for you there. So that was interesting. I'll have to mess with people every now and then. But um, okay, let's get into this. We have a really important topic today. And awesome to have Carl Sterling here from Physio Chains Education. Thank you for coming. And, hey, um, thanks for having me. Oh, of course. I've been wanting to talk to you for so long. I mean, I love what you do. I love your passion for helping people with Parkinson's and um, all kinds of things. And so we know with as part of this health yeah series we always ask in the beginning you know is exercise important for parkinson's disease and health well i'm supposed to say health yeah not hell yeah sorry about that but health that's yeah great. but i mean that's how i feel about it and so real quick before we jump into everything why don't you give us a background on you and um how you got started and kind of what you're up to Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks again for having me because you and I have been communicating for actually some years yeah, now. Yeah. Now I finally get to talk, so this is cool. And one of these days I'm going to get to Seattle. But In the um, summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll try to give you the quick one minute rundown. I did 35, actually more than that, years as a drummer for a living. Mm -hmm. um, I never actually really wanted to, but that's besides the point. I'm good at it. I'm not great, but I'm very good. It just came natural. So my parents are musicians and all that stuff. But anyways, towards the end, the last few years, I was so burned out. And I knew I didn't want to do that forever for a living. Um, but I had gained a ton of weight, mm -hmm. like 300 pounds. I'm 6'2". So 300 is bad. Mm -hmm. um, I was very unhealthy. I got a health scare from my doctor. And I was so afraid that I decided to um, call a trainer I knew, right? from the parking lot when I went out. So I started getting trained the next day. And this is going back about 10 years. Okay. And so fast forward, six months later, I'm weighing in like 260, 265. A year later, I'm like 230 something. I'm feeling really, really good. And I decided I think I'm going to, I want to help people feel better like I feel. So I did uh, fast forward again a few months, did NASM, got there. CPT. And then I started uh, training for a while and decided, you know, I want to, I need to know more. So I went back to school at Syracuse University. I live in Syracuse, New York. I went back for nutrition. They ended up hiring me to work there as a trainer on a part time basis, but um, it's kind of like full time hours. I had a ton of clients. It was the best way to get in front of bodies every day, just mm -hmm. show people. So I pretty much lived on the campus uh, all day. Um, and that is where one of my professors came to me about seven and a half years ago, and he knew I was a trainer. He said, will you please train me? I said, yeah, so let's talk about some things. And he says, well, I have Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. I mean, I didn't say it like that to him, but in my head, I'm like, oh, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, I said yes to him. I knew I could say yes because it just what happened at the same time. My son was at Hershey Penn State doing an MD, MD PhD program. And he is, was well into his PhD research, which happens to be Parkinson's related. So I get home that night, I call Nick, I'm like, dude, we have a situation. <laughs> me in the right direction because I need to know what to do and what not to do because I know nothing about this population, even though I've been Googling all day till I could talk to you. That was the beginning. Okay. You know what? what the way, he, the direction he pointed me and the people I got to meet helped me so much that actually, even though I feel really badly that, that my client, Jerry, who's still 
my client. I only have one client now. I don't do one-on-ones anymore, except for Jerry, but mm -hmm. I, I work with him and he's doing fantastic. And um, I f found it and still find it to be saddening that they have the disease, but fascinating what we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. It's been a really great, interesting, exciting journey, especially when we see how how much we can do to help them that isn't like common knowledge yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about two weeks ago, we interviewed an, a very similar story where somebody, a personal trainer, she was approached. And for this case, the person happened to be an adaptive athlete. And she was approached in the same manner. This person, you know, wanted to row and had never, she had never trained anybody who was paralyzed before. And, um, and she said yes, you know, just like you said yes. So it's kind of a great theme that we consistently see where if more personal trainers are open to other patient populations, right, then things start getting really interesting and we start helping more people. So, um, right. so I love that story. You know, you, you had mentioned a little bit about what you start to see. And so why don't you tell us, actually just for anybody who's tuning in, we have people, you know, they're kind of in a caretaker role or newly diagnosed. Let's just talk about what is Parkinson's disease, okay? And, and what you see in terms of how it impacts people um, in their body and their family and their life. Okay, yeah, those are really good questions. So if you look up the clinical definition, it's a progressive degeneration of the central nervous system. Well, that's really, really broad. Mm -hmm. So technically what's really going on is in the very mid brain area, there's the basal ganglia part of the brain. And inside that is the substantia nigra. It's a little butterfly shaped place. And it's actually a very ancient primal movement center of the brain. Cerebellum helps, helps us move too. But um, the thing that's particularly uh, important about the substantia nigra is that it's also a really big dopamine production center. Mm -hmm. But in Parkinson's, what's happening is the uh, brain cells in the substantia nigra are dying. And so the more of them that die, the less um, dopamine is produced. And dopamine, for those who don't know, is a neurotransmitter. So for example, if you've ever watched somebody with Parkinson's who for, for example, maybe they, uh, this is me, I'm, I'm on my legs, right? I have Parkinson's, so I want to get started. And I'm like, uh, uh, my head knows I want to go. My brain, I consciously know I want to move, but my feet just won't go. And then, boom, I finally go. Uh, that's lack of neurotransmitter for the brain to tell the body what to do. <laughs> so, I mean, there are ways that we work with that. There are dopamine replacement medications, um, all the kind of stuff. I mean, that that's the neurology part. I'm, we do our stuff too to help them to get started or not freeze or not fall. But the more that those brain cells shut down, the more that movement is affected. Um, the number one cause of, not, not to be like scaring anybody, but I could rattle off statistics all day, but mm -hmm. when it comes right down to it, it's a really imp it's very important to know that the number one cause of death in the Parkin Parkinson's population are complications from a fall, not necessarily the fall. Mm -hmm. It could be they fell down, got a concussion, had to go to the hospital, got pneumonia, and died. Because number two cause of death in the population is uh, complications from breathing issues. Okay. There's a whole breathing parameters with lack of dopamine and. Uh, of the ventilatory parameters change, so then breathing tends to get more shallow. So that's why exercise is so good. Mm -hmm. Cardio, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that later. So how does it affect people? So we know we know what it is now. We know that it's a neuro uh, degeneration of the central nervous system. We know the part of the brain that's dying. We know we have a lack of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. So this will affect our movement. Some of the um, Motor symptoms, there are four classic motor symptoms. Tremor, mm -hmm. not everyone gets everything though, right? Not everyone gets a tremor. Some people never get one, but mm -hmm. it is common. Um, rigidity, which is just being really stiff. Bradykinesia is just being slow. Where, like your gait will change, be a little slower and maybe shuffly feet or asymmetrical uh, gait pattern. Mm -hmm. And the last one, which is actually the most severe, is postural instability. That's responsible for far more falling 
than the first three I listed combined. The tremor is the least debilitating, but it looks the worst. Okay. Um, you know, on yeah. So a lot of times, right, especially as we see an aging population, just start to get different side effects of growing older, right? Like we'll hear from people a lot of times that they didn't, you know, they didn't know that they had Parkinson's until they had a fall. Right. And then they have all these struggles to get into a doctor and have to wait months and months and months before they can actually see, you know, a professional. So how do you know, you know, what is that moment where you're like, I need to go see my doctor. These are not this is not normal. This is not a normal aging process, you know, and that fall is more than a fall. Like, what are the triggers that you think people should watch for? Okay, so first of all, I'm really glad you asked that question because, yeah, no, no. So um, can I, I have to show you a book right now. Show us books all day. We're going to put it together a reading list after this. I have many books for you. (laughs) Um, I met this author. He's at the University of, uh, where is he? Um, UCLA. His name is Dr. James Bredesen. I'm sorry, Dale Bredesen. Um, He's a neurologist. He's wrote this really great book called The End of Alzheimer's. Now, there's a reason I'm showing you an Alzheimer's book. Mm -hmm. Dale Bredesen, you have to, everybody must read this. I have, uh, for the books I really like, I've got the audible version so I can listen. Mm -hmm. And these, I can mark them all up inside with highlights. So, first of all, this is not going to be answering your question right away, but we'll get there. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, according to Bredesen, and other plenty of other research will live right here mm-hmm. first for 10 to 20 years before you manifest any symptom at all period now a symptom doesn't have to be falling or tremor um let's say you you just see a, a one one arm doesn't swing as well anymore and the person with parkinson's isn't going to probably notice but mm-hmm. perhaps the caregiver if they notice that uh you know, their husband or their wife, the the arms aren't swinging the same way, especially if it's one side that's not swinging. Um, That's something to monitor and think about because that's one of the first earliest signs. Actually, before that though, new research just came out from Dr. Tony Lang and Toronto Western Hospital, University of Toronto, saying that if you are thrashing around in your sleep, Mm -hmm. acting out your dreams, and I'm saying beyond restless leg syndrome, but that also could be a symptom. Um, if you're really acting out your dreams, that usually becomes comes before losing arm swing. If you're acting out your dreams, your partner will know if you have one with you in the bed and they might be getting hit. So you don't really want that, right? So that is the earliest, earliest, earliest sign that we know of. They could be 20 years away from a tremor, but they still might have the disease. Mm-hmm. That's coming right from Toronto Western. Um, another thing is a diminished sense of smell. Okay. Okay, so one of the first signs of any kind of movement disorder, especially Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and I'm sure some others like multiple system atrophy and I'm not sure what else, but Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, if you notice, if in the person with the issue probably won't notice as soon as somebody else, or soon, as soon as somebody else might notice, hey, you didn't smell the burning toast in the kitchen or something? Mm-hmm. No, no. Well, you always used to. Well, you know, I didn't smell it. Well, that's a sign. Now, we really would want to go to the doctor at one of these points. But the problem is, and I say this with all due respect to the medical community, there's uh, there are a number of factors to deal with. First of all, your general practitioner, uh, they might even take a tremor that is Parkinson's to say, oh, no, it's just an essential tremor. Don't worry. You look fine. Mm-hmm. It could be Parkinson's. It could be you have no motor symptom, but you are thrashing around a bed and you can't smell as well and your arms aren't swinging the way they used to. And they'll just say, oh, it's part of the aging process, but you know something's not right and it's more than just aging. It's we want them to take us seriously mm-hmm. so that they refer you to somebody. And maybe if your insurance will cover it, get a DAT scan, DAT mm-hmm. scan. It's like an MRI, but you have to drink the magic green fluid and wait three hours. Then you'll know. I mean, you, well, it's not a guarantee. 
but at least you'll know if the substantia nigra is lighting up the way it's supposed to. Okay. And it, it doesn't. It doesn't mean it's Parkinson's, but it's one of three things or two other things that it could be. But I mean, certainly in motor symptoms, uh, if somebody starts falling, I have a lady I started working with a couple of years ago. We worked for about a year together. She had no tremor. She's really fast. She's too fast. She's 85, she, well, 86 now. No rigidity, no tremor, fast, has Parkinson's. Postural instability has caused her, well, two years ago, 17 falls in a one year time period. Mm -hmm. I happen to know she fell down last fall and hit the back of her head. The back backwards falls are really that's bad. So mm -hmm. start looking for uh, those early symptoms and, you know, try to get the doctor to take you seriously. And be your own advocate, basically. It's like you have to go in there. And be, I mean, uh, amongst multiple health conditions, right, in terms of being your sure, own yeah. advocate. It, it's so important. And I, I mean, I know people who've taken Jerry, my first and now my only client with Parkinson's. He was diagnosed in six months. Boom. He had a little tiny finger tap. And he, and they knew. And that they were right. I know uh, my friend Ian Frizzell in uh, northern England, I've been to England a lot and taught, and he's come to a few workshops, and it took him, I think it was 16 years to get diagnosed. Wow. I hear all kinds of stories because doctors aren't listening, and I, I again, we need our doctors. This is not to say anything bad about it, but we want them to listen. So try to find one that is recommended who, who, who will listen and take you seriously. That's all I can advise in that area. Okay. So now you work on a day-to-day, -day, like constant 24-7 basis of trying to figure out or nailing and teaching exercise for Parkinson's. And if you can get, let's get in a little bit into the types of exercises that you do, why they're important. And, you know, we're all told to exercise more. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Fights preventable disease, prevents the progression of the disease. We know these things, right? But it's, yeah. it's vital for Parkinson's disease and the progression. And maybe you can get into that. That was a lot of requests there. But, uh, uh, yeah, pr like jump into that. Okay. I'm happy, too. I could talk for <laughs> days about this. Um, I just want to put something up here. It's, it's uh, what I call a spectrum. And over here is I'll put FL is functional life. And then there's... Uh, Med. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this or not, but on the left, okay. we have, let's call this medication, physical therapy, education, personal training, whatever, to help the person with the problem, right? Over there, FL is functional life. You'll notice there's a big gap between there. Well, that's because there's a big gap between there and real life. So, are, are you, people like you, like me, we're trying to go into the middle here. We want to fill this and, and, and complement, we want to complement these things. We're not here to replace them. We're here to carry over what they, where they stop for whatever reason, money, insurance, whatever, uh, and, and then fill this gap so they do live a better functional life. So my approach is a little different than your average normal trainer because as a, in my teaching history, um, one of the things I taught a lot was uh, the Barefoot Training Specialist Level 1 and 2 course for the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Uh, founder of that is a, a friend and a, one of my main mentors, like top two mentors, uh, Dr. Emily Splickles. So besides the uh, foot structure, which I find is fascinating, I, I'd like to study feet because there's, they're a foundation for our movement. So we want a good foot posture and all that stuff. But what else is really cool is, the, like, the first thing that I want to do is um, wake up the nervous system and the brain. And, like, that is the very first thing we're doing. So it doesn't matter if it's a person in a wheelchair, because we've had lots of people in wheelchairs, and we'll get their shoes and socks off. And maybe they can stand with assistance. A lot of times we've had people who can. But let's say you're a person who can move and walk. Just the mere... Uh, act of taking off the, the bare feet. So I'm going to go into another book now. Um, Emily talks about this. And then there's this book called Harvard's professor, Dr. John Rady, wrote a book called Go Wild. Now he talks about a lot of nutrition stuff in here. It's, uh, but he also talks about 
the benefits of being in nature, but also the benefits of being barefoot. Mm -hmm. um, because over the years, over the decades, when we wear shoes and socks, and some people always wear shoes and socks, like they never go barefoot. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is, uh, the, the well, first of all, we have to know that the plantar skin on the bottom of the feet is the most highly densely populated with sensory nerve endings, mechanoreceptors, sensory receptors. And as we wear shoes and socks over the decades, they go to sleep. They don't die, they shut down. We want to wake them up. So if you just take off shoes and socks and be in, you know, a safe environment with no glass or anything, you're going to cut yourself. You maybe your house or if there's an area at the the gym or some a lot of these boutique gyms or whatever they allow barefoot. Try to get moving barefoot. But of course, you're not going to go outside and go to the grocery store and all that barefoot. So Dr. Emily, um, um, when sorry, I have to go back. As we go barefoot, those nerve endings start to wake up. The ones that went dormant from shoes and socks will start to wake up. So now we have more sensory input. We have uh, uh, that shoots a message through the peripheral and central nervous system right to the brain, probably the cerebellum. We're not really sure, and it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You wake up the nervous system and the brain, and it's like instant because that's what happens when you wake up those nerves. And the more you go barefoot, the more you wake them up. So. We have uh, actually a yoga site, a yoga mat of the same thing as this little, this textured insole here. Mm -hmm. You can see that. Mm -hmm. This is a creation of Dr. Emily's uh, Naboso technology. Oh, so now you can take these, put them in your sh your shoes, and a lot of R and D research and development went into these, and the spacing of these and the depth of these. And I was with her when she was going through R&D and a lot of prototypes came out. It's like, oh, no, nope, not this one. Nope, not this one. And a few of them. And all of a sudden, this one, this one is making the difference. Okay. So I've been all over the world with these. And we'll put them in people's shoes, not telling them anything that we just told you. Like, we're not saying, oh, you're going to move better and all that. Because we don't want them to think ahead like and expect anything. We also have the, the neuro version of it, which... Uh, the lighting's not real good here, but it's a pointier surface. Okay. okay. These little bumps are like pyramids without the top cut off. Now, do you recommend these for people who, is it, you know, only Parkinson's or just anybody can wear them or um, Alzheimer's, they're starting to struggle. When do, at what point do you suggest sure. wearing these? I wear mine all day, every day. Okay. Now, if it's, we, we use them with athletes, like the yoga mat of the same textures, um, for our martial arts for Parkinson's classes, we do. Uh, it's it's entry-level mar martial arts with a lot of good things about it we can talk about in a while. But we have a neuro version of the yoga mat she does, and she has the regular version. We use the neuro version in the classes, and you know they come in on the walk. We have a bunch of them lined up in a row, just kind of wake up the nervous system. Um, to answer your question, uh, we've used them with athletes. Mm -hmm. I don't work with athletes. I don't really know how to, but the people I know who do, when we use these with athletes, that they just wear them for a few minutes, and um, sometimes they just go barefoot for a few minutes. There, there is research out there that shows that um, uh, barefoot before playing volleyball or basketball or running a marathon or triathlon or whatever. These athletes, if they can get like a half a percent faster, sometimes it's enough to maybe they come in second place, first place. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I love talk, so I talk about bare feet all the time, and we see this. I I mean, I literally I think we could spend a whole session on barefoot fitness. Oh, yeah. But we even see this. We see this in the ER. I mean, in the in the ICU, we see it when cancer patients are cycling our device. We see it all across the board. If we can get people to cycle with bare feet. You know, at first they're a little like, oh, my foot gets cramped. We need to make that foot stronger, right? So I could talk about feet all day long and, and hands too, right? So you yeah. get a lot oh, into the hand fitness. It's next on my list. <laughs> there we go. So now we've we've woken up the, the feet. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The second most densely populated with small ending nerve endings is your hand. Now, I happen to like the hyper ice 
um, Hypersphere made by Hyperice is the company. It's a vibrating ball. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear it. I can hear it. Yeah. You can see it vibrating. Okay. So I've had people, I remember I was at a big, there were like 500 people at this uh, symposium. I was a keynote speaker in Mexico City last September. And, you know, I always have a couple of these with me when I travel. So I go up to this gentleman and I like to go talk to people before and I speak Spanish fairly well. So, you know, hola, como esta, blah, blah, blah. And you talk about the tremor. I said, here, because he's like this. Both, mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. like, Hold this for like five minutes and I'll be back. So what's really cool is I go back five minutes later. He's already given the ball to somebody else with tremors and his hands are almost perfectly still. Amazing. Now this is temporary, of yeah. course. Yeah. But you know, my clients have all the they all buy these because um, they can get them off my site. But anyways, they buy them because like let's say they want to go out to dinner and they're afraid of this, you know, mm -hmm. and dumping something. Or they need to button a shirt in the morning or do a zipper or something with makeup or hair. So the fine motor skills, um, nothing works for everybody all the time, but this has worked so well to help to diminish tremors. Uh, sometimes you'll see like a, a dystonia where they're just they're moving a lot, or we had a guy with abdominal dystonia where mm -hmm. the stomach kept popping out. So we put the ball here mm -hmm. about five minutes. This was out in Denver last about a year ago. Gone. I mean, temporarily gone. It could be gone 10 minutes or three hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea is we want to have them a, a bunch of things. The, the, the main goal is let's over uh, improve the overall quality of life. And if that means you're able to write a check, mm -hmm. it means you have to go to dinner and eat the dinner without burning yourself or, you know, spilling something on yourself, that is a big deal. Oh, yeah. And, and so we can use the ball for that. We, we, in the workouts and it, now people buy these insoles from me. I have like a stockpile of them and they put them in their shoes and they notice they feel safer, more secure, more balanced. Their stride length usually gets better. Their stride symmetry gets better. This is just automatic. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, not all the time, most of the time. Their arm swing, I don't even say anything. And usually the arms start to swing better. Hmm. If people go to the top site here, and my handwriting is absolutely horrible, but it's parkinsonregeneration.com. I have a Nabosum tab. On that tab, first page is information about what is Naboso, these these insoles. Mm -hmm. Top down has videos. There are 20 videos right now. If you go go there and look at the before, which before is like side view, treadmill, normal footwear. There's a description by everyone, so no way they wouldn't be confused on what they're seeing. On the right side is immediately after putting the insoles. We have them walking outside. Uh, we'll see the movement is improving so much. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely. So, that, so, yeah. Uh, like now, after you've woken up the central nervous system by yeah. focusing on the feet and the hands, and then start to get into additional just daily exercise or, or exercises you're doing in the in the gym and the training people to do like what's the next phase very good i'm gonna turn this off okay so um yeah and i talked for a long time about that but it's because it's so important mm -hmm. there are three main areas that i look at uh right now i can only think of two <laughs> yeah, maybe the third one will pop maybe up they'll come to me <laughs> wake up the nervous system and brain that's one uh, well, actually, the two main categories are retraining the brain because mm -hmm. we know, okay, another book, here we go. Uh, there are two that I really like by two, two different authors. The Brain That Changes Itself, mm -hmm. Norman Doidge, uh, if you can see his name, yep. uh, um, there it is. He's out of Toronto. He has another one too, which is an extension. It has the best pa par uh, Parkinson's chapter and the best Alzheimer's chapters I've ever read in my life. Okay. The Brain's Way of Healing Itself or Healing. Yeah. It's also a really good sequel. 
The other book that talks about this, Retraining the Brain, is User's Guide to the Brain by John Rady, again, the same one who wrote Go Wild. Mm -hmm. um, while we're at it, let's just finish up the Rady stuff. There's another one he wrote called Spark. We'll talk about this when we get talking about cargo. Okay, so the second big thing is, and it may not be in order of this, but the second big thing we want to do is we know that as we go through life, at any given point in time, we can learn new to do new things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like a uh, hundred years ago where they thought at the age of five you were done growing your brain. Mm -hmm. Our brain can regenerate itself. It can regenerate well, not every part all the time, but it can learn to do new things because of neuroplasticity. Right? So that means it's moldable. So, for example, I've been learning, well, let's go back. Uh, you learn how to ride a bicycle. You're, you're not good the first day, mm -hmm. right? You might have fallen down. Um, probably did, if I like I did. I mean, and then, and then a couple of weeks later, though, because you keep doing it, what's happened is these synapses, like if, if these are neurons and these are neurons, these electrical synapses happen. And then the more they fire together, they eventually, boom, they wire together. Mm -hmm and so on and so forth. So millions of them, you get your bicycle riding neural firing pattern. And the more you fire that, mm -hmm. so the more you ride, the better you get. So what we what we know is that with falls being number one cause of death for complication of fall, we wanna avoid, avoid falling. Uh, Cause statistically, once they fall, they're three times more likely to fall, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we concentrate on a lot of things like focused movement. It could be as simple as just walking and doing some kind of cognitive exercise. Like Dr. Lisa Morituri has done a lot of research on this. She's really cool. She's down at Stony Brook in Long Island. She's a neurologist. We have different things we can do. Like, you know, maybe we're saying the alphabet or uh, yesterday at a class, we had a group and I said, okay, you know, you name a state, Next person name the capital, next term person spell it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Spell it backwards. And then we keep going, but meanwhile, they're throwing like two rights and a left, right? Two rights and a left. Two rights and a left. And then we switch it up. Or we had them um, dribbling a basketball while they're walking mm -hmm. and doing some other thing like counting backwards from 247 by sixes. Or I mean, it depends. Like, we have to do what they can, not what they can't. Sometimes the really difficult counting things and math equations aren't going to work or long words, spelling them forwards or backwards won't work. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, that's called direct recall type of training where you're recalling, uh, okay, capital of um, Washington is Olympus, right? Mm -hmm. Olympia. Close enough. <laughs> Mount Olympus? Olympia. Olympia. Ah, darn it. Okay. <laughs> See, so, you need to come to Seattle. <laughs> no, I was just we'll take you to Olympia. Olympia. I was testing you. No, uh, <laughs> so we'll, you know, spell it forward, backward, the alphabet, math, and all that. Then we that's so that's like a, a direct recall. We could be doing um, spatial awareness. Okay, so now maybe you're jump. Maybe if, if we do what they can, not what they can. We have people like Jerry who can jump single leg sideways or zigzag through a, an agility ladder, and maybe I'm throwing a ball back and forth, and yeah. he is uh, telling me how to get from wherever we are to his favorite restaurant, let's say, which happens to be on the other side of town. So there are a lot of turns. So I want him to actually be doing this passing of the ball, jumping sideways or however we do, and then tell me, okay, I get out, I go down the Erie Boulevard, I turn left on Thompson Road, I turn right on Burnett, and because your brain actually fires in a different way when you're doing spatial versus capitals and math and all that. It's called, well, spatial, spatial. Then we have direct recalls. So we could have, I don't have them with me here, but yeah, I've got like mitts, right? I'm wearing mitts and they've got gloves. So I've got R for right on my right, L for left. I got a yellow piece of rock tape here and a green one here. Like, okay, I cue every punch. You know, right, right, left, left, yellow, yellow, green, green, mm -hmm. or do opposite. Whatever I say, you do the opposite. Or maybe all lefts are odd numbers. So a jab is one, hook is three, uppercut is five. All rights are uh, even. 
two, four, six. Mm -hmm. So the challenge with that is like, I actually have to know what I'm doing and I screw up all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's actually good for both of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to do as much as we can in the way of activating the vestibular system. Then that's like just turning your head mm -hmm. and moving the eyes. This book is really, really cool. It's called The Infinity Walk. Mm -hmm. Dr. Perry Nixon told me about it. For example, we could set up a cone here, a cone here, and then another one over here. They're walking a figure eight around this set of cones while their head looks at that one. Okay. They never break contact. So as they turn, their eyes are tracking, their head's moving. So we have visual activation, vestibular activation during the focus movement. And maybe we have them do some kind of cognitive exercise as well. Um, the nice thing is that you can get really creative with this kind of stuff. Like you can get creative with the cognitive training. There's stuff that people come up with and movements they come up with at workshops. Like, okay, I'm going to do it and I'm going to teach it too because it's so cool what they'll come up with. Um, I have not heard the connection to the vestibular, like vestibular exercises while doing it. So that's, that's interesting. That's not something I had seen anybody else really focus on. Yeah, there's another thing we do too that actually, um, I have to give credit where credit is due, uh, do is Z Health. Okay. Z Health has some super amazing stuff. Um, for example, if you take someone, we'll do what we call the, the pencil push up test. So I'll take like a, a, a pen or I'll use a drumstick for now because I'm okay. a drummer, right? So <laughs> I could be, um, what I'm actually looking to do here is, keep the drumstick one. So as I'll try to line it up here. So as I bring this in towards me, now I'd be doing this for the person. Mm -hmm. I want to see and check how their eyes track. Hmm. When can they not make it be one anymore? And does one eye come in better than the other? Then what we do. Maybe, oh, my pen here. Okay. So I had to now, do that. So if I was the trainer or the physio or whatever, I'd be watching you as I do it to you. And I'll be looking to see your right your eye, your left eye. How are they tracking? We can do a lot of other tracking movements too. We can, you know, be, um, you know, you know, up, down, um, you know, sideways. But, but we don't, you know, I could talk for days about this. But then what we'll do is have them like cover an eye. Oh, I'll use this one because I don't see the other one. <laughs> then we'll look at this, and we just go down that thing as fast as we can. Okay. Like, all right. So. You know, Q, N, D, M, E, K. We don't have to say it out loud. I'd rather have them go top to bottom, mm -hmm. focusing for just a millisecond here, millisecond here, then back and forth and back and forth, and go down like top to bottom three times. Okay. Then do this again. Okay. And what you'll almost always see is, and they actually notice the difference too, is um, that the eye that wasn't tracking as well tracks better. Mm-hmm. Then what happened to me after I, this was done to me a couple of years ago and uh, my friend Deanna Cordoba in DC, she's so awesome. She owns a gym. I was teaching there. She did it to me. I come back and I'm playing catch with Jerry and I didn't miss the ball because I'm always missing the ball because this eye doesn't see and I have bad depth perception with mm -hmm. things. Right. So he's like, dude, what's up, man? Like you did, you count, you count the ball every time you never do that. Yeah. And, there was a carryover for days from just doing that reset. And even though this eye, I can see light and dark, but mm -hmm. I just moved the eye. Mm -hmm. Even though I couldn't see the letters at all, it still helped so that when it came at me, I could get it. Well, this, this is the feedback we get from people when we do this in the group class, too, is they really like it. Mm -hmm. Um Oh my God, there's so much to talk about, but it's, it's well, really- Well, it's, what you, what, just what you've explained right there scares me for future generations who are today where we're so buried in our phone and our eyes aren't tracking anywhere and like all these sm small motion movements, right? And then even today, per, a lot of personal trainers and fitness in general is focused on these large, large movements and these huge things. And sometimes, you know, it's about helping somebody get, you know, being able to take their shirt off, like you're saying, button their shirt, do their tie, put their own makeup on, you know, but um, I get a little nervous. I, I call it T-Rex zones where we're living here. 
right? right? And our phone, phone and our car and keyboards, keyboards and, and our eyes, eyes are buried on these screens. screens. And so these yeah. are things for yeah. all of us to practice all the time. Text neck. <laughs> yes. I saw a post the other day. I don't know who did it, but text neck is so important. It's so appropriate, you know, mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, yeah. Huh. I actually have it and I try to remind myself to not have it. So we're, we're barely scratching the surface, but for example, so we go back to wake up the feet, okay. wake yeah. up the hands, wake up the nervous system, wake up the brain, do cognitive training during focused movement, do vestibular activation. If I'm going to pass the ball as they're walking through an agility ladder, I'm running around them because okay. I want the head turn. I want this. I want the eyes tracking. So we want the, the deeper brain stimulation, according to uh, Dr. Um, Marcus Ernst at Colorado Springs Brain Clinic, and the guy is amazing. He uh, he talks about the deeper brain stimulation without using machines, but like electrodes and all that would be the simultaneous focus movement, vestibular activation, visual activation, and uh, did I say cognitive? No. Yeah. So thinking, eyes tracking, head moving, and focused movement. So let's talk because we, um, I want to get into the importance of cardio. And like we're working right now, we really want to do a study on upper body because we can get people's heart rate going really fast, quickly, right? And so the important role that cardio plays in this entire thing, we have our small movements, but on the cardio side. Yes. I'm and the high, the quicker we can get the role of vigorous exercise right yeah. and why it's so important in preventing the progression of the disease okay before that i'm just going to mention one thing okay um i've never found a bad parkinson's program just i want to put that out there yeah what i put mine together for is to try to play um to put together what i think or hope is the most comprehensive and complete mm -hmm. so i don't know if it is but it's the best i can make it at the moment at any given time and it's always growing I want to acknowledge a couple of people. I want to acknowledge Power Moves in um, Tucson, Arizona, because, I mean, there are things I wish they did, but you know what? They did some really good stuff. Power, um, I, I want everyone to buy my stuff and come and see me and all that. Yeah. I mean, if they're in Arizona, go to Power Moves because it's very good. Now, they talk, they talk about something that is very important, um, big movements. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have this flex forward posture usually with Parkinson's. I yeah. have it anyway, so I'm always trying to. So if we're doing some of these, you know, big movements, mm -hmm. activating the posterior chain, maybe trying to release some of the mm -hmm. anterior chain, that is very important. There's so many big moves we can do. Um, I'm going to plug something. My membership site, $15 a month or $150 per year, physiochainseducation.com. You can join for a month and then cancel. Um we haven't had hardly any cancellations. I'm very happy with almost 300 people now. So, but our goal is not just Parkinson. This is just everyone. Yeah. And we keep, because everything we do, just to clarify, it has to do with everyone, not just Parkinson's. Yeah. Our general population uh, has a forward posture. So big moves is important. Rock steady boxing, another really good program. I mean, we have had so many people come to our workshops from there, and when they leave, they're like, wow, we can make our program better. Mm -hmm. But we have people come in who are highly trained, you know? There's no prerequisite to train for them. You don't have to have movement knowledge. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, there are pros and cons to everything, but they're really good programs. Um, but what I like about Rock Steady, for example, is something we try to emulate in our own ways, and that comes right around to cardio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you think about cardio, uh, I think the best reasons for cardio, the two top two reasons I could think of is as you move less, your cardiovascular conditioning will probably diminish. Mm -hmm. And if breathing issues are number two cause of death, we would love to have our lungs working well and our cardio cardiovascular working well. So for everybody, there, there's an advantage. But another thing that's a real game changer is there's a lot of research on this, is when you elevate the heart rate and the more vigorous, the better. Mm -hmm. And according to Dr. Moratorius, at Stony Brook, at least 20 minutes, but 30 would be better. Mm -hmm. You can take little breaks here and there, but um, 
the the more you can elevate the heart rate to you know 70 80 percent like we were talking off camera yeah, earlier we're, we're trying to get you to 80 we're the, you know at a minimum then what happens is the elevated heart rate causes the brain to create this growth hormone uh, it's a protein it's called brain derived neurotrophic factor bdnf oh. I was going to write it down. I don't know where my marker went. B D <laughs> brain derived neurotrophic factor. Um, John Rady talks about it in this book called Spark. Now he talks about it relative to um, high uh, high school kids in Naperville School District, Illinois, and how high their grades are and how their obesity rates the lowest in the country. But when we look, but they get BDNF going in their heads too, but for all of us, when we create BDNF via elevated heart rate, which mm -hmm. is the number one way to do it um, by far, this uh, neurotrophic factor circulates in the brain. It helps to slow the progression of dying brain cells. And according to Dr. Wendy Suzuki at New York University, who I just spoke with yesterday, and we're going to hopefully do some research together. Um, she did an interview for my YouTube series. Um, she talks about how BDNF helps to give birth to new brain cells, mm -hmm. especially in uh, people with, well, especially in the olfactory bulb area, which is sense of smell, and the hippocampus, which is memory and future planning. So a Maria, Maria Shriver's study that came out two years ago of people with early onset Alzheimer's who did cardio every day for, I don't know how long the study went, but uh, most of them improved their memory. And we would speculate because BDNF helped to give new birth, birth to new brain cells, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. cool. But if we don't have a disease, and hopefully we don't, well, let's say we're genetically predispositioned to getting one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. to help delay the onset. Maybe it will help to avoid it altogether, but at least help delay onset. So as I say in Mexico and Spain, cardiovascular, Cardio, cardio, todos los días, mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. I'll take the day off if you have to, but do it a lot. Do it 20, 30 minutes a day. And I, whatever study you do, I want to know the results because. Well, I'll tell you, I think, so we're working on this right now. What, you know, we're consistently hearing that getting the heart rate to that 70 to 80% max volume, right, is really hard. It's hard for people, you know, with health conditions. And if we can do it faster, here we're trying like and do this at a university where if we can get it up faster and we can do it in shorter bursts of activity, right? Yeah. Then things start getting really interesting. And I tell people, even if they don't have an XE, you know, taking your arms to the side and just sitting here and doing oh, yeah. this, right, drives your heart rate up really fast. Yeah. I, I show people this because yeah. I'm like, look at my heart, right? Why rock? So I mean it's um I can't talk, but um you know why boxing is so great is like getting these arms going and so i will keep you posted and if um and yeah. i i really want to make this happen because there's all kinds of studies on cycling right with parkinson's yeah. disease it's number one one of our number one reasons that people come it, to us so i'm i could go off on that all day <laughs> oh i love it cycling and swimming is really good too yeah. but um i tell you that i just have to show you something ridiculous you okay. take a towel yeah just wrap the towel like this yeah we, we do that and then in the workshops we'll do one minute of uh somebody always has an excuse well i can't do cardio because yes okay well can you sit on the edge of your chair okay can you do this Arm swings, right? Yeah, like yeah. Arm something, swings. something. Just do one minute, take a minute off, and do it a few times. I mean, people are sweating, they're laughing, their, their heart rate is up. And so cardio is possible to do in many different ways, and it's very important. One of the reasons I, I like, you know, I wear an Apple Watch, and I, and I tell people all the time, I do these little tiny movements sometimes just out of fascination, like carrying in the groceries, right? Yeah, I look down, yeah. and I'm like, 170? What the heck just happened? My yeah, really. at 170 from doing the groceries. Um, real quick, if you can, I know for people who are interested in becoming, you know, a trainer for Parkinson's, you have this ready, this bag of tricks kind of ready to go. You know, how do people find you? You know, what should people be, what should they consider? And, um, you know, obviously they can get in touch with you. But what would you tell people who are thinking about, hey, I want to start working with Alzheimer's. I want to start working with Parkinson's. I want to start working in this area. Good question. Thank you. Um, 
Can I mention one other thing before I answer? Sure, that? sure. It's just, it's, we do so many things with these people. We do a lot of traditional balance stuff. We don't do a lot of traditional strength training though. If mm -hmm. we didn't do anything, it's gonna be suspension training, body weight training. Yep. We really wanna retrain the brain, but we also wanna get them on the floor mm -hmm. because so many people are afraid of the floor and what if they fall down? Mm -hmm. So we teach and so far, where's wood? Here it is, knock on wood, 100% success We'll have somebody at every single workshop or symposium or, or more than one person who can't. We have a, a thing I do. It's the only original idea I ever had in my life, and it's this. is Carl's Take Me Through Your Day Assessment. to say, okay, so, Michelle, you, you wake up in the morning. You have Parkinson's. You open your eyes. What's your first challenge? And it's not uncommon to have somebody say rolling over in bed. Mm -hmm. I can't get out of bed. I can't roll over. Well, darn it, we're going to help you. First, we'll get you on the floor. The, the dogs are... Sorry. FedEx. FedEx UPS. It's going to the UPS truck. <laughs> it's okay, puppies. All right. I meant to mention that could happen. So if we get them on the floor... Hey, Zoe. Relax. I'm surprised my dogs aren't responding. <laughs> they like at this bark fest. But... Uh, excuse me. Okay. Hey, okay. Come here. Yeah, they're, it's just the UPS guy. So we get them on the floor. We teach them to roll. And then we actually teach them to get from a um, face down position up onto all fours. And then crawl. Mm -hmm. Crawl backward. Crawl to an object. And teach them a strategic way of getting up mm -hmm. with a chair or something. Or sometimes, what if they can't get up? Well, there's nothing there. Well, we'll teach them how to get up with no prop. Now, there, sometimes we have problems. But if we do it often enough, we really work it, we can usually have them get up just by positioning of the knee and the leg and leaning. And, and so I mean, it's so important to, you, you, you know, just we need to look out for them basically as well. so i'm really sorry maybe you can say, hey, send me um, this <laughs> <laughs> um i you have some videos on your on your website that i'll add when i do a blog post on this and um you know of, of getting on the floor and rolling over and it's some wonderful training and this always reminds me of you know, these small, fine motor skills that really change people's lives, right? And whether it's Parkinson's, osteoporosis, arthritis, like we see all kinds of things, right? When we can make yeah. small changes, then we can make huge impact in day-to-day -day living. So I appreciate yeah. these. We, we'll have to do this again, for sure. Um, one thing I just kind of wanted to wrap up with is your suggestions for a caretaker. You know, there's, there's sure. you who have, you know, the condition, but the caretaker, whether you're far, you're close, you're in there on a day-to-day -day life, what are some tips for the caretakers? Uh, okay, this is perfect because um, I wanted to segue on the last thing, which actually goes right into caregiver, and it has to do with this. We've had this happen so many places around the world um, where somebody comes in and, and they regain an ability that they had lost. Mm -hmm. Like we've had people actually not be able to roll over, and then they can. And, and they might come in like this. They're like dragged in by the spouse or caregiver and they don't want to, you know, he can't teach me anything. This tough American, big shot American guy, whatever. Well, <laughs> then they realize I care about them. They realize that we can help and I want so desperately to help because I know that when they, no, no, no hey, 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 no, it's all cool. Uh, <laughs> come here, puppy. It's just UPS. <laughs> And he's leaving now. Okay, but great. So <laughs> when when they regain, like this one lady, a uh, friend of mine in uh, Mexico, um, she rolled over, and I, I didn't know why she was crying, but I found out that night when she posted, commented on something, that um, it's because it's the first time she rolled over by herself in five years. Wow, five years. Yeah. Wow. And so she's only 43 at the time. So you diagnosed when she was 28. But the thing is, is that the best part, this is the best part, this is where caregivers come in, is she went from feeling defeated and hopeless. That, that moment when she kept rolling and we couldn't stop her, <laughs> mm -hmm. she became a fighter. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, we text 
probably every other day now. She is unstoppable. She's back to running because she got the insoles and all that. So this can literally like this here. When you regain something, you get something. You. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's fine. I, it's fine. Then what happens is not only is she feeling good, the caregiver gets a break. Mm -hmm. right? so Ernesto's not pulling and pushing her in bed anymore, and she's off and doing things. She's independent. She's back to work now, too. We've had several people who go back to work, and now their income, household income is higher, and they were struggling before. Mm -hmm. My advice is for the person you're with who has who you're caring for, try to get them to do something. Go to somewhere. Um, go to a rock study. If we're in your area, come see us. Mm -hmm. If you want to join our website and get on, it's, I mean, it's not the same, but it's there. Mm -hmm. If you're not disciplined to work out with videos, work along with us and do it yourself. But it's usually better if it's in a situation where there's a group because sometimes socially they have withdrawn. So now they come in and they make friends. Um, get your person to do something at a Parkinson's class wherever you are. Because it's gonna change, even if it's just something super simple. It could even be just. I said there's no bad Parkinson's classes because there really aren't. As long as you're doing something, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Even the most basic thing, do it, and and you're going to probably realize some kind of a relief. Mm -hmm. And when this shifts, your life as a caregiver will shift as well because now your person you're with probably has a little bit more hope, positive attitude, and things are going to change. Yeah. Do something. Get them somewhere. Absolutely. Drag them in. Drag them in. We see, um, I see a lot of our customers will say that they have, you know, they'll do like dancing for yoga as a couple or yoga for as a couple or, um, you know, chair yoga, all kinds of things, but where the care taker will get involved in it and actually sees benefits in their own life, you know, so it's like a nice, oh. you know, thing to do. I'm glad you said I forget so many things because there's so much to say. I, in our martial arts for Parkinson's classes, uh, caregivers are almost always there. Mm -hmm. And many times they come in, they jump in, they get involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're part of this thing that we're doing, we're going to launch a licensing thing next month. And it's the martial arts for Parkinson's. And it's kind of like you buy a license like Rocksteady or whatever. And, and then we train you. We offer training every week to the coaches so that they can teach our concepts Great. in their facility. What I like about that better than the two-day workshop is two-day workshops are great. They come in, they learn a lot, they get excited, they go home, and they don't do much. In this, they're coming in two, three times a week. They're not only moving every week, yeah. but they're yeah. having an education along the way. And that's the pathway of the future for me. Awesome. Uh, one last question. What technology, like what things have you, new new research, the research I think you, but technologies, we see things with like virtual reality, augmented reality, or other oh, things. Yeah. Like what, is there anything on the technology side that has you excited that people should know about? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only take a minute. Okay. First of all, I already talked about insoles. I talked about this. Um, I have a foundation I have to say for one second. If anyone's interested in, Supporting any research we want to do, we want to do uh, Nabosa research, hypersphere research, and postural taping with rock tape oh, because yeah, yeah. the postural taping is such a great way to help as a reminder of sensory input to the brain to stand up straighter. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. um, what I really, really like is uh, some of the augmented reality, uh, virtual reality. And my son, who's also a computer guru, basically, he's down in Atlanta. He's a doctor in Atlanta, but we we are. I can't promote it yet, so it's not like I'm trying to sell anything. Yeah, well, you'll no, know it's always on that. But it, it does have to do with a virtual reality, uh, eventually augmented reality, because then you get, you know, if you you have goggles on and you there's a camera that helps you see your surroundings, and you're moving around in your real surroundings. But then the the lens brings in like balloons, let's say, and your job is to pop all the balloons. Mm -hmm. You get visual and vestibular going. That's you get hand eye coordination while you're moving in a safe environment. And maybe you're doing it on, um, I can't remember this thing. I saw it in London last year, and I'm going to buy one soon. It's like a wobble board, but it's hooked into a computer so you can control the cursor yeah. with your balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, ah. 
when you combine a lot of this stuff, as long as it's safe for the person, maybe you'd be right next to them in case they, you don't want them to fall, that any time you can do like this virtual reality, augmented reality is totally, it's like the best stuff in the world, I think. Huh. Even the old Wii, the Wii games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of that stuff is really cool. You don't need goggles for it, but but just being interactive like that is so good for people, visual, vestibular, hand, eye, and movement. Absolutely. All right, tell us really quick. I, I have it on here, but we can get really, um, your website where people can find you. Okay, so if you go to purposesregenerationtraining.com, you can find our live workshops. You'll find recommended reading lists, and there's a lot more books on there than I showed you here. You can email me from there. Okay. You can sign up for a live workshop all workshop revenue in our online course comes out next month all revenue goes to the next one which is our my foundation okay my income comes from other areas so all workshop and all online goes to fund research so parkinson's global project.org is 501c3 nonprofit, and we're about six thousand dollars away from our first study university of toronto with Naboso. Awesome. Then my membership site, physiochainseducation.com, $15 a month. You can sign up. If you don't like it, stop. You will spend $15, but usually people like it. And um, uh, we upload stuff every week to, um, as I learn, I keep uploading. There's so well, much I, to share. What I like is that you're sharing. And I appreciate, one, your passion for solving. I mean, just for helping, right? If we can get even the, the people who produce the VR and the technology and the AR and all these wonderful things that work across, you know, they're marketed towards sports and things. We can start thinking about, the, you know, helping with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all kinds of wonderful yeah, yeah. things. Then we start changing the world. So I appreciate your passion for this in a big way. And thank you so much for joining us um, for sure. And then there's the global project. There you go. And so if, you, so cool. <laughs> if you make a donation uh, of thirty dollars, yes. you get a T-shirt or a copy of the CD that's coming out in June that I'm recording right now, which is music for people with Parkinson's, picked by people with Parkinson's with a positive message. It's all upbeat songs, all positive messages. Awesome. Stuff. So we're psyched about that. That's awesome. Recording. Yeah. That's your passion for music combined with your passion for Parkinson's. Like that. How? That's, yes, that's uh, when it gets fun, right? Yeah, it's really cool because um, just 10 seconds, a, a, a friend of mine who produced my last CD in 2010, he called me up last year. He lives in LA. He says, I got a guitar player friend of mine who has Parkinson's. Can you please help him? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. So do Skype. Well, I've been following this guy for like, I have the CDs right up here. You can't mm -hmm. see them. Mm -hmm. I have like 10 of the CDs. I've been following him for 25 years. Now wow. I work with him. Now we actually are doing a recording together with these amazing musicians who have played with all kinds of bands you've all heard of. Mm -hmm. and so it, it, it's the idea that proceeds from that go to research and we want to put something out with a positive message. So this is like my old life music, the new life. Life, but it's music with a purpose, a different kind of purpose. It's awareness and positivity. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us for sure. Thank you. And exactly. um, I really appreciate it. Lots of good information. I'll, We'll put together a nice blog post that really captures these, and then I'll send that your way. And I really appreciate it. And I'll keep you posted when we get this when they, we get this research going. Thank you. All right. Very have, much. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.